everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, we are here for the winter backcountry navigation presentation from Portland Mountain Rescue. We have Andre Vika and Mark Morford, two veterans on the search and rescue team. I think 2003, Andre, for you and 2007 for Mark. Um, and I'm Jess Joyner from Mountain Shop. Um, the presentation tonight is webinar format. So everyone will be muted and then you can type questions into the chat and we'll be monitoring those as we go. Um, we also have a special surprise um, on X backcountry. We have some coupon codes for on X backcountry, which is an online navigation app. And if you're registered and participating in this in this call, um, you can come get a card from the shop, just show proof of registration for this webinar and you'll get a free trial. So I'll send out more details in the recap, but just wanna mention that now. Um, yeah, and with that, I'm excited to hear what you all have to say with all this snow coming in. This is definitely good timing for this, this webinar. So I there will- There is so <laughs> much powder, Jess. As All right, are we on, Jess? Yeah, it looks good. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, as Jess said, my name is Andre, Andre Vega, and uh, I'm with uh, Portland Mountain Rescue together with my uh, fellow rescuer, Mark. You want to say hi, Mark? Oh, hey, guys. <laughs> There's so much powder. Mark, Mark has had the pleasure of testing the powder the last few days. I have unfortunately been stuck in town. Um, and can't comment on how nice it is, but, uh, but Mark promises that it's really great. Um, <clears throat> so we're gonna go through a, a, a topic today, which uh, is about winter navigation. Um, and Mark has found his uh, secret powder stash. He may let you in on his secret, uh, but the question is, uh, will you be able to find your way back to the car uh, in a whiteout after dark with blowing snow? As we all know, here in uh, the or here in Oregon, Portland area, Mount Hood, uh, the weather is not always good. Um, so if you like to ski, whether you backcountry or cross country or snowshoer, uh, whatever you like to do, uh, chances are someday you may get caught in some less than optimal conditions. Um, so today we're going to go through a couple of different topics. First, I'll speak to some of the tools and kind of technical skills. Um, that go with navigating in the winter. Um, sometimes some of these apply to summer, kind of all year round navigation as well. Um, and then Mark will take over with uh, soft skills and uh, being prepared. So um, as, as Jess mentioned, if you have questions along the way, please type those into the chat um, and we'll do our best to answer them either during um, the slides or afterwards. So please don't be shy. All right, so first let's talk about old school, uh, map and compass. Um, these are technologies, it's kind of hard to call them that, they're not really technologies, but these are devices that have been around to help us navigate for a long time. The compass has been known for, I think about 2,200 years, has been used for navigation for about a thousand. Um, and I, th I think Mark is the only one here who's used uh, even more ancient technology. He navigates by the stars sometimes, but it's a little difficult in the winter time when it's uh, overcast a lot. That was harsh. <laughs> you, can, you can get me back later. Don't worry. Um, the compass, uh, it's, it's waterproof, basically not possible to destroy it, doesn't need any batteries. Um, just leave it in your pack um, and you don't ever have to do anything to it until you need it. Uh, maps, on the other hand, paper maps in this case, um, they of course can get wet, uh, keep them dry, put them in a Ziploc bag, buy a dedicated case for them or something. Um, or uh, I believe you can get several different types of maps these days that are printed on uh, waterproof paper. Um, so that's another option as well. Um, and, you know, we, we would recommend that you always have a compass and a map as a backup. Take it with you in the pack. I, I just leave my compass in my pack that stays there all the time. Never take it out unless I'm outside um, doing stuff and, and, and using it. Comes with the added benefit. In my case, I have a sighting compass like in the middle shown down below. 
um, that if I ever have a contact lens problem or anything like that, I have a handy mirror with me as well. Um, but as with anything, and probably even more so with a map and compass, you do have to practice. Um, it doesn't help to just put it in your pack and leave it and never take it out. Take it out on a nice day. Take it out in your neighborhood. Take it out when you're on a hike uh, with the family or on a sunny day and, and, and practice using it. You want to make sure that the time when you actually need it to get home, that you know how to use it. Um, and a couple of things with, you know, the, these, these what we call, I guess, what I'm calling old school technologies um, is you practice so you are always certain you know how to set a bearing and follow it. If you need to go 282 degrees to get back to your car, make sure you know how to set your compass for 282 degrees and follow the direction the compass is telling you to go. Very, it's simple to do, look it up on the internet, take a class, but you know, learn how to do it and practice it. Here in Oregon, um, you also wanna be able to make an adjustment for declination. Um, declination, for those of you who don't know, is important because the geographic North Pole, which is the way your map's pointing to the North, and the magnetic North Pole, which is the way your compass is pointing to the North, aren't the same. Um, you can see in the lower right corner of my slide here how the declination varies based on where you are in the United States. Um, if you happen to live in Illinois, um, you'll see you're basically on the zero percent on the zero degree line, meaning that the magnetic north and the geographic north from your standpoint in Illinois is about the same. Here in Oregon, on the other hand, there's about a 17 degree difference, I think now, Mark, is that right? Yeah, 17 and a half, I think. Yep, 17 and a half. And, and you know, the magnetic north pole drifts. It's not stationary, but it doesn't really drift fast enough that any of us will have to worry about, you know, this in our lifetime. Um, it's but, actually but, changed two degrees in my lifetime. Okay, well, except for you, Mark, you might have to worry about it. Uh, but the point is that if, if you look at your map, uh, a good topographical map will show you at the, bit, at the bottom of it, if you look in the middle uh, graphic that I have at the bottom of this slide, you'll see, it's a little hard to see on this slide, but you'll see that it has a diagram that indicates the difference between the north as indicated by the map and the magnetic north at the time the map was printed. Um, so you can see that in the case of Oregon, um, it's, as Mark said, about 17 and a half degrees difference. So your compass is pointing about 17 and a half degrees to the east of the compass's north. So that's, that's important to take into account um, to be able to navigate properly. And you can buy compasses um, that allow you to set that in the compass. There's a little screw on the bottom that you can permanently set it. Um, otherwise, it's a pretty straightforward uh, task to just use uh, simple math um, to account for the 17 and a half degree difference. Um, the other point that's very important uh, when using a map and a compass is being able to find the coordinates of your location on the map. Um, the leftmost example, you can see here um, that it's showing some tick marks on the, I guess the, the, the X axis and the Y axis of the map. Um, you'll wanna make sure that you learn how to uh, indicate your position um, and how to um, you know, write it down, how to summarize it in case you need to give your position um, to someone, whether it's uh, a friend or a rescuer, or if you just want to extract the position of a really good ski run um, and, pro and plot it into your, your uh, GPS device. Um, all right, so uh, since we are living in 2021, soon to be 2022, um, you know, most of us uh, are going to be familiar with digital map and digital compass solutions. Um, pretty much everyone today carries a smartphone. Um, if you don't, congratulations, you are one of the very few who doesn't do it. Um, and with this technology, uh, you pretty much always have a compass in your pocket. You may not know it, you may not ever have used it on your particular phone, 
Um, but there is a little chip inside um, that can read the magnetic flux lines the same way that the needle um, in your analog old school compass can and show you your direction on the screen. Um, if your phone doesn't have a built-in compass app, you can find one in the app store. Um, same goes with digital maps. Um, pretty much every phone comes with one built in, um, whether you have Google Maps or Apple Maps. Those are the two most prevalent ones. Um, <clears throat> however, Google Maps, Apple Maps, they're really intended for getting you around in a car um, or getting you around in a city. So they're not super useful uh, when you're out in the wilderness. Um, so you might want to look into a dedicated app that is made for hiking, backcountry skiing, mountaineering, whatever. Um, and, and I'm just showing one example here. This is no implicit endorsement, although it's a good app, um, and that's Gaia. Um, and the huge advantage with these digital uh, mapping applications, whether it's Google Maps or Gaia or the one Jess referred to, is that they'll show you your position, your direction. They'll show you, you know, exactly where you are on the map, on your screen. Um, so huge advantage in, in, um, in that case. Um, do keep in mind that depending on which app you use, they may not show your position in the same format. Um, there's a lot of different formats out there um, for position. And maybe if I can just take 30 seconds, I can probably show this. Maybe people can see this. This is off of Google Maps, Lolo Pass Trailhead. You'll see the position there is what 45.4, uh, comma minus 121.79. So that's showing you how far uh, where you are in north and where you are, uh, what is that, east or west? One of the two. Um, and then contrast that to Gaia, which is showing you the same location, the Lolo Pass trailhead in a 10T format. So Google Maps uses lat long um, and Gaia is currently set for the 10T base function. So we're not gonna go through the differences and, and, and why these are as they are, uh, but just be aware um, and learn about the different um, base positions that the applications use. Most of them can be set in the settings um, and we in PMR typically use 10T. Um, another couple of good things with uh, the digital map is you can typically download the maps in advance. Um, so Gaia allows you to download maps. Google allows you to download maps. A lot of websites out there will allow you to download maps of where you're going. You can even create your own and download it. Um, or if you're at an unfamiliar trailhead, there'll often be a map at the trailhead. You can take a photo of it, bring it with you. Um, and it can serve backup purposes. Now, um, of course, there are some drawbacks with using digital maps and compasses. Um, batteries don't last forever, particularly on smartphones, which you're often using for a lot of different things. You might get a phone call, you might send some text messages, you might be posting on social media, um, in addition to using the compass and the map. Um, so those things drain the battery and you really want to have a back up there if the battery is not uh, lasting long enough for you to get home. Um, and then also some applications and some um, mapping and compass functions may require a network connection. Um, you don't always have a network connection in the backcountry. Um, and as many of you may have experienced um, water on the screen, snow on the screen, uh, water in the charging port, snow in the charging port, cold weather, um, these make it hard to keep your device operational um, and to operate them properly. All right, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about global navigation satellite systems. Uh, most of you will know this is GPS. Uh, GPS is the US system. Um, there are several other systems out there and whether you know it or not, your device is leveraging satellites from a bunch of different navigation systems um, to give you a position. Um, <clears throat> same thing is with the digital map and compass. Um, a modern smartphone um, has a GPS receiver built in. Um, and you can get a typical accuracy for GPS um, down into about 
you know, 10 meters or less. Um, the stated accuracy is somewhere around one meter, um, but that can be impacted by where you are. Um, if there are clouds, uh, trees, terrain, if you're down in a canyon, um, that, can, will, that can and will impact um, your location accuracy. And in fact, in certain circumstances may impact your ability to get a location at all. Um, so my recommendation is for those of you who rely on um, these GPS devices, uh, try using them on the good days. Make sure you know how they do um, in certain types of terrain, certain types of weather, um, particularly smaller devices like uh, GPS watches will often be more impacted um, just because they're smaller and don't necessarily have the best um, receiving antennas. Um, and Drake, could I interject just for a second here? Yes, you sure may. You, you talked about um, the skill of using a compass and a map. And, you know, I think for most of us that do a lot of backcountry travel, particularly uh, off trail, which is what we do in PMR all the time, uh, we're often following a bearing towards a specific uh, location. So we take those coordinates, we set them into our GPS as a waypoint, and then look at the GPS and you will say go to or however that function works in your device. And it'll give us a bearing. It'll say, you know, a mile and a half at 282 degrees. Okay, so that's great. That's super good information. I think a lot of people try to follow their GPS. They're like holding it in front of them to follow it to the bearing. And that is just a super clumsy and even dangerous way to use a device. What most of us do is uh, we grab that bearing 282 degrees, we whip out our compass, we set our analog compass to 282, we turn our GPS off, put it back in our pocket, and um, we keep the compass in our hand and consult it, you know, every 100 feet or whatever, uh, so we can follow that bearing. And will the best way to do it is you know, wherever you're standing, you hold the compass, you sight it in at 282 degrees on that tall tree with the two tops to it. Okay, now I'm just walking to that tall tree with the two tops to it. And you just keep doing that. Um, but that's the skill I think is most important with the GPS in navigating backcountry is knowing where you want to go by coordinates, getting a bearing and following that. Andre, how do, how do you do it? How do you use a GPS to get somewhere? How do you use it to get back to your car? <laughs> Same thing, right? I mean, for, for going to where I'm going, I use your technique, right? Which is to get my bearing and then using my compass to follow that bearing. Cause I don't, I don't want to hold my phone out. I don't want to hold my, you know, dedicated GPS. I don't like having stuff clipped to my front, you know, other than like small, you know, compass is easy. I can slip it in my glove even and just have it in there and pull it out when I need it. Um, but then I'll, I'll also usually turn on my GPS as tracking function, okay. right? So then when I do get to my destination and I want to get out, then it's usually a pretty simple process to ask my GPS, okay, where is my, you know, where's my track? You know, or if I ski down the run and my track's at the top of the ridge, I'll usually set a waypoint on the ridge mm -hmm. so I can get back to that track and then follow the track back out. Um, if I were really smart, I'd remember, oh my gosh, it was 282 degrees when I went this way. <laughs> and then I just subtract 180 and then I'd go the other way, but I'm not that smart. So I have to rely on my device to tell me that I need to turn around 180 degrees to get home. Yeah, well, at least you're one of those guys that remembers to turn on your track function <laughs> uh, before you're four and a half miles from the trail yet. Congratulations. Yes. And, 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 you know, these are, these are learned things, right? It's like, I, I, I have to, I tend to come, to, I'll come to the conclusion that I would rather not argue with myself. This goes with my, my avalanche beacon as well, my transceiver. This has got nothing to do with navigation, but I put it on when I leave the car. Go. So I'm going back under skiing. doesn't matter where I am because I don't want to be in a situation where I argued with myself and then I'm in a really sketchy place. And I was like, oh, wow, I really wish I'd put that on. 
It's the same thing with my navigation, which is why I always keep my compass. I don't always keep a map, but if I'm going somewhere new, I always have a map. Um, and then I, and then that way I know that I always have it with me and I don't have to, you know, second guess myself when I really needed that backup. And the same goes with the track, so. Um, all right, and you actually brought up a great um, technique, you know, Mark, for, for saving battery, right? Because if you're out on a day trip, most of these devices will last during the day. But if you get lost and you end up being out for longer than you planned, or if you're on a multi-day trip um, where you don't have access to power, then conserving your electronic device's power becomes important. So you want to make sure you don't want to be the guy or the gal who was out there at you know midnight and you just called 911 and you're still trying to find your way home, but your phone just died or your handheld GPS just died, then you lost an important tool in your ability to rescue yourself and get yourself home. Um, so, you know, that brings us over to the, I put a little bit of this together, right? If, you, if you're out there and in the past, pretty much everybody had a dedicated GPS, I think. You know, now so many of us have smartphones that many of us don't carry a dedicated GPS. Um, but if you look at it from a, you know, how do I, what benefit do I get out of choosing one device over the other? Um, and, you know, clearly battery life tends to favor a dedicated GPS because it's only doing one thing. It's only being your GPS. Whereas your phone, you know, you're making calls, you're posting photos to Instagram, um, you're getting text messages, you know, your phone's doing a bunch of stuff in the background you don't even know that it's doing. Um, Performance wise, they do the same. Um, a smartphone in many cases will actually give you your position a little bit faster if it has a network connection um, because it can download the almanac, which is what it uses to compute your position from the cell phone network instead of having to get it from the satellites. Um, ruggedness, you know, the dedicated GPS tends to be built for being outside of your pocket and in wind and snow and rain. It tends to do better. Your phone's not so good unless you have a really nice case on it. Um, and ease of use. In my view, anyway, that tends to favor the smartphone. But the key here, again, is practice. Any, any, any device that you know how to use is the best device from your personal standpoint. So know how to use it, whatever you choose to, to have with you. And so, you know, practice. Same thing is with the map and compass. Bring them both when you're out and about. Find your location. Find your coordinates. Set a destination, a waypoint. Set a track, follow, you know, practice using that information when you're out on a nice weather, when you're out on a nice weather hike, a nice weather ski, so that you're, when you're in a bad situation, you know how to use those tools to help get you home. And then as, 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 as Mark said, right, if you look at like, how do you, how do you best leverage these tools? It's preserve the battery, make sure that you will have enough battery to get you back to the car. So use your compass to follow the bearing, dim the screen, use airplane mode on your phone to turn off some of the transmit and receive functions um, that are draining battery. Um, download maps, your routes, whatever you need, waypoints before you leave home, before you leave your source of reliable power. Um, many dedicated GPS units um, will have replaceable AA batteries, bring spare ones, um, you know, consider, I, I never carry a power bank myself, but consider carrying one if you use your phone a lot. Um, and especially if you're on a multi-day trip, um, have some sort of a solution to charge your phone. Um, another thing that some people do um, is many phones come with a share your location function, um, which is a very simple way as long as you have a network connection, uh, but that drains the battery as well. So. Just, so, just Andrea, I, I got to interject here on preserving the battery. <laughs> Several years ago, we had a mission. I call it the Facebook mission. Yes, I know that one. Okay, well, you tell the story. So there's this guy that, I, you, you tell the story, now I'm going to tell it. But <laughs> <laughs> this guy, he gets, he gets stuck. He thinks he's climbing Mount Hood. He goes up instead, um, Crater Rock, and he gets stuck up there, and he calls 911, and... Um, and then once he talked to the sheriff and he knows the rescue is coming, he, you know, tell him to stay put. It's going to be hours before we get to him. So he, he whiles away that time posting on Facebook and Twitter with all of his friends. 
<laughs> and this, of course, his battery's dead. We can't reach him. We really can't find him either because he's in a really odd spot. So the little bit of advice, we learn our advice from experience. So added to Indre's list here is don't use Facebook after you call 911. So just remember that. <laughs> well, I was going to say, I mean, it was actually in this case, we learned, I think it was in retrospect, but somebody found the guy on Facebook and looked at some of his photos he had posted. And, and a lot of phones yeah. will geotag your photo. Yeah. And the location that was geotagged on the photos he posted on Facebook were actually very accurate. They were. That, and, and that was after the fact. <laughs> that was after the yeah, fact. So it didn't help us at the time because the, the coordinates that the sheriff had gotten through the 911 system they were, uh, a were cell not ping. particularly accurate. The, the coordinates we had for that mission were a cell ping. Yeah. And, and that actually brings up a great point, Andre, in, in using devices. Your cell phone, as Andre mentioned, has a GPS chip in it. Whether you have activated it or not, 911 operators, if they remember their training, and that's a big if, can trigger your, when you are on the 911 call with them, they can trigger your GPS and extract the coordinates of your location. But don't ever count on that. One of the things you should know how to do is to find your coordinates on your cell phone. And I'll just do this real quickly here. I'm just looking at the Compass app on my iPhone. There it is. And if you look right below where it says which direction it's pointing, you'll actually see my coordinates in lat line. Right there it is. Um, if you do a screenshot of that and send that to the sheriff, uh, we love you. Mm -hmm. We can find you. We'll be dead on. Andre, we've got a few questions in um, the, the chat. And um, I'll just call out a couple of these. The first one is, Hey, I use a map and compass. What's a waypoint? You want to go with that? Yeah, sure. So a waypoint, you know, many, many times you can't take a direct route to your destination. So a waypoint is simply just an intermediate point um, that'll take you from, let's say you're going up to um, Mount Hood, to the summit of Mount Hood. From the parking lot, you may plot a course that goes a little bit more to the west to get out of the, what is it, White River Canyon that's right there. Um, so you, you set your bearing to the west, and then you say, okay, I'm going to go for three quarters of a mile, and that's going to be my first waypoint. And then you hit that waypoint, and then from there on, you take another bearing that goes straight to the summit. So it just allows you to adjust your route to account for terrain features, uh, maybe snow conditions. It could be anything that, that would cause you to not take a direct route from your uh, initial point to your destination. Perfect. And so here's another question, uh, and I'll take this one. Will putting your smartphone into airplane mode um, to conserve battery, will that remove or turn off the GPS uh, capability? And the answer is, you got it. It, it depends. <laughs> um, so with the current version of iOS, it's Apple and what I'm most familiar with, uh, it does not, airplane mode does not turn off uh, your GPS function. And that's important to know because if, for example, you have a GPS, a, a mapping app open on your phone, your phone, whether you have um, that window open or not, whether you have the screen on or not, uh, your, your GPS is tracking you in that map. It's constantly updating itself, whether it's Gaia or it's Apple Maps or whatever. Um, so even if you have it in, in airplane mode, that GPS is still working to, 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 to snag that, the, the satellites and talk with them. So back with conserving battery, uh, if you're really trying to conserve your battery out for several days, I keep my phone off and I turn it on when I need to check my location on the GPS or I need to pull a bearing and then I literally turn it back off again. Mm -hmm. For earlier versions of iOS, airplane mode uh, did turn off the GPS capability, but you could go into your settings and change that. 
and I do not know how this works on Android and someone yeah, else. It's, it's, it's the have. same on, on, on Android now, Mark, because, you know, airplane mode was really intended to turn off all of your transmitting functions. And, you know, many people don't know this, but you never talk to, you never transmit anything to a GPS satellite. It's a complete one way communication. Mm -hmm. You're just listening. So your device when, when it's in airplane mode, it's perfectly legal. It's perfectly fine for it to listen um, to the signals coming from the GPS satellites. The one thing that will have an impact on your battery life is uh, if you have your GPS set to high precision or low precision. High precision, it's constantly computing your location based on the GPS signals. And in low, and in low precision, um, it only does it every so often. I don't know what the, what the duration is, but um, you know, it, in, in, in high precision, it's doing so several times a second. So. Well, I, and I bet you anything, I've got mine set on. <laughs> oh yeah. Everybody has, most people have theirs on high precision, right? It's, <laughs> it's the most useful for getting around town. It's the most useful for, you know, finding where you need to go. So we've got a question here uh, and I'm not sure what the, um, the person means and Indra, you may, what's PMR's opinion on what three words as a method of location. And I'm sure that's a, a mnemonic technique or something, but I don't know it. Hmm. I don't know that either. So you may in the comment may want to just uh, talk about that a little bit and we'll swing back to it. Uh, another question here is how can you get a bearing in a whiteout condition? And um, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Yeah, you'll get that one, Mark. All right, let me finish and hand it off to you, Mark. So this is the last tool I'm going to talk about. Actually, I'm going to mention just one other thing here. Oops, sorry. On the previous slide. Um, a lot of us used to carry um, altimeters. Um, and you know that's still that's still good. Altimeters are very useful, um, especially when you can't see. Um, but you know most of most devices today that have GPS built in will also give you your altitude. So it's perhaps less useful now that technology has evolved. Um, but the last thing I wanted to touch on before handing it off to you, Mark, is is hey, you know, what about my inreach or my spot? Um, you know, in PMR, we, we really like these devices um, when they're used in their emergency, uh, for their emergency purpose. Um, but, you know, do keep in mind, you know, many of us have these. They've gotten quite inexpensive compared to what they used to be. Um, so many of us have these today. And, and these aren't navigation devices. They are two-way satellite communication devices. Um, they do know where you are. They do have a built-in GPS receiver. And I, there may even be some new models now that, that are both a, a you know, kind of handheld GPS as well as a two-way satellite communication device. I'm not super familiar with uh, the newest models. Um, but you, you know, these devices are primarily intended for status messaging. They allow you to send simple text messages, much like you can with your cell phone, um, and receive simple text messages via either the Global Star or the Iridium satellite network. Um, the most useful aspect from PMR standpoint, though, is that they allow you to send a very accurate emergency call um, if you get into trouble. And, and we've used these devices, or we, we, we have leveraged the information provided by these devices uh, on at least a few rescues over the last few years, um, where someone's in the wilderness, you don't need to have a cell phone connection, um, you just need to be current on your plan, it's registered to your name, um, and when you push the emergency button, it transmits your location and the fact that you have an emergency to a central emergency activation system um, that will eventually, actually really quickly, get to the appropriate county in the US. And in the case of PMR, PMR would then be activated if it's within our jurisdiction um, with a very accurate location. Um, but you know they cost money, they have a monthly plan or an annual cost just to have them in, in your pocket. So do you wanna tell that story, Mark, or should we just go on to your slides? Well, I don't know the story, so let's move well, on. I was just thinking of the, the recovery up on Snow Dome. Oh, yeah, yeah, just super quickly. Uh, this was a case where the fella, um, it was a fatality on Hood, um, a solo climber, 
uh, had, uh, I believe it was an inReach, I can't remember, it might have been a spot, had it on, um, wasn't using it, wasn't dropping breadcrumbs, it was just on. And his family reported him as missing. And somewhere along the line, someone in the sheriff's office thought to ask the family, does he have an inReach or a spot? And they said, yes. Um, they contacted that company. I think it was Spot. They contacted them and um, Spot was then able to see data from uh, where his GPS had been pulling down coordinates um, and was actually able to tell, oh, this Spot unit has been stationary for like 36 hours and gave us those coordinates and that took us directly to, um, sadly, to, to the individual's body. But uh, it was it was a new thing for me to realize that that was um, one application and capability of a of a spot unit. Yeah, and and somebody asked Mark if 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 there are differences in the accuracy between the two, but I I'm not aware of any significant differences. I suggest if you want an answer to that question, go on the various forums and you will find hundreds of answers to that question, uh, none of which are authoritative. Yes. All right, Mark. I don't, I don't think there's any significant difference between doing the two. You all see, also see a lot of debate about which one is better at capturing the satellite signals in a canyon and and in a wide out, and, and again, I really don't think there's significant difference. They do use different satellite systems, networks, um, but uh, I, I, it, it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. All right, so um, as you can tell, Indre is a guy who knows the technology. Uh, I'm old, and so what I have is wisdom. Uh, wisdom, of course, is earned by adventure, and adventure is de de defined by the lack of wisdom. Uh, so it's a wonderful uh, reinforcing cycle. And when you're old, um, hopefully that you benefit from that some. So I'm just gonna cover uh, several circumstances for winter navigation. Uh, and you can see them all here on the screen. I'm not gonna run through that. Andre, why don't you move us along? So the first is snow covered trails. Um, Going for a hike, even on your favorite trail in the winter, is never as straightforward as you think it might be. Uh, and, you know, okay, if you're really prepared for a winter outing, maybe this isn't a big surprise to you. But if you're on a spring hike in the gorge and you're just going higher and higher and, and you're beginning to get patches of snow and pretty soon you're crossing snow fields and pretty soon the forest around you is snow, um, now you actually do have a challenge because the trail that you thought you were on is no longer visible as a trail. It's all covered by a blanket of snow. Uh, sometimes, wonderfully, the trail has been packed down, as you see in this photograph. There's a, an excellent skin track. But you can also look at this photo track, photograph and tell that if there were not a skin track, uh, it might be difficult to tell where the trail goes. If you look very carefully in that photograph, just, just to the right of my wife there, you'll see a little blue blaze on the trail. And that was thoughtfully put there by the Forest Service or someone helping them because this is a winter cross country trail um, and it is blazed with blue blazes high on the trees so you can see them all winter. But even then, standing where she is by that blue blaze, if the skin track were not there and she didn't know the trail, um, she would have difficulty discerning where the trail goes from there. You can't see another blue blaze um, and uh, the trail might not be uh, in indented. And more importantly, uh, the corridor through the trees that you think sort of looks like a trail is often misleading. And it's a natural corridor and not a corridor that was formed by um, some volunteer in the summer spending a miserable summer cutting down trees and building trails. Um, and the last thing I guess I would say on that is snow covered trails. Very often the trail alignment isn't even the safest route. Um, a trail that runs along a steep traverse covered with snow may be very difficult. It may be prone to slides. It may hide a lot of uh, hazards under the snow. 
and just all the way around trying to navigate to a trail uh, is difficult uh, in, in, in the winter. Go ahead, Drake. So, okay, so what are your strategies when uh, you can't see the trail nicely worn as a path in front of you? Well, I think a lot of people say, well, I'll just follow my tracks back home. Um, <clears throat> that won't necessarily get me where I'm going unless I'm following somebody else's tracks and I know who they are and I know where they're going, which are big assumptions. Uh, but to get back, you think, oh, I can just follow my tracks. Again, as I said, I have lots of wisdom. Uh, and you can guess where this is going more than once, more than once <laughs> in, in recent history, uh, I've turned around thinking I'm going to follow my tracks and I can't see my tracks. Um, in the winter, we have low light, uh, low light across the snow creates various shadows. Every sun cup looks like my track. Uh, although my boots may have a distinct tread on the bottom, uh, that tread melts out very quickly or the wind has blown snow back into my tracks. Uh, just quite simply, following your tracks home um, is a high risk strategy all by itself. Sometimes great, um, sometimes a very poor strategy. So what do I do uh, to know my way back home? Well, first of all, frequent look backs. Uh, stop frequently in the trail and just look back and see what does my route look like on return? If I were going to turn around right now, would I be able to see my return route? Are my tracks clearly visible? Uh, or did I walk across this, this snow patch uh, on hard, ice crusted, sun crusted snow, and I didn't leave any tracks. Um, so uh, look backs are great. Also just flagging your route. And don't do this in ways that are um, uh, interfere with other people's experience and leaving big cairns and stuff along the way. You don't need to do that, particularly in the winter. But taking a stick and sticking it straight up in the snow in the middle of the snow field you just crossed, um, so that it's obvious it didn't just land there and you could see it on your way back. That's helpful. Um, throwing some stones out, you know, when you cross an area where you, you know, it's bare and you can grab a handful of stones, grab them, then go across the snow field and sprinkle those stones across the snow field uh, as you go one way and, and that may help you get back. These are just strategies. But the look back, I think, is, is the most valuable of those. Um, I'm often going in front and so I combine the look back with turning around and just checking on the rest of my party. Um, I have to remind myself, don't just check to see that the dog's still there. Check to see what it looks like um, from whence I came. So here's a, um, <laughs> we're back to wisdom here. Um, here's a really common problem for backcountry travelers in the winter. Uh, we love to go, let me back there, Andre. Yeah, sorry. We, we, we love to go above treeline. Uh, that's where the best vistas are in certain conditions. That's where the best snow is for skiing. It's just, you know, part of the wonderful thing that is uh, the Cascades in, in, in the winter. Um, but what often happens is uh, travelers emerging from the treeline and going above the treeline their route in front of them as they go up is very obvious. It's a clear day. They can see the summit. They can see illumination saddle. They can see whatever it is they're going to, the stone hut on the north side. They can see it and they just walk towards it, um, all the while thinking that navigation is super simple. And then they turn around and then you go back down. And the question is, well, once I get to tree line, the trail will be obvious we hope, or I can follow my tracks when I'm in below tree line, or there'll be blue blazes below tree line. But the trick is to find the place where you left tree line and went into the Alpine. Uh, and that's sometimes very difficult. I made the, this mistake years ago on a spring climb of Mount St. Helens with a bunch of Boy Scouts for crying out loud. Um, 
And uh, I think we were supposed to come back down, was it Monitor Ridge? Uh, uh, Worm, Worm Ridge looked the same to me. Uh, and down we go. And, you know, we're a couple of miles away from our intended route. Um, I, of course, blamed that on one of the Boy Scouts uh, and everything was fine and the parents knew none the better. But, um, you know, truly, it's, it's a common problem. It is also a factor that shows up in our rescue missions. Uh, this very location where this photograph was taken was um, uh, the scene of a, a big search mission about five years ago, four years ago, uh, over on the north side. And a couple of dads left their kids at the uh, Cooper Spur ski area and skinned up the uh, Palaui Ridge Trail, uh, got up above tree line, uh, needed to get back down to pick up their kids by four o'clock. They didn't make it because they're over on Gnarl Ridge, uh, at least two ridges to the west of where they wanted to be, the southwest. Um, they spent the night out there with a couple of angry moms who had to pick up the kids at Cooper Ski Area and wondered where the fathers were. Um, so, uh, yeah, key thing, you got to have a strategy for finding your way back to uh, where you emerge from treeline. Andre? Yes. Yeah, and this is common these days, right? I mean, there are a lot of people in this area and backcountry skiing is getting more and more popular. Is that your skin track or is it the one over there? Yeah, or is it yeah. the one you can see, you know, faintly over in the bowl? Or did someone else come up Worm Ridge <laughs> instead, of, instead of us? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. So again, strategies, and these, uh, these will sound familiar from other parts of the conversation here, frequent lookbacks. This is so important when you've gotten above tree line. You know, get 100 yards above where you emerge from the forest and look back at it. Take a bearing, just go ahead and take a stand where you are and take a bearing, you know, kind of sight the summit or wherever it is you're trying to go over your shoulder and straight in front of you where um, you emerge from tree line and uh, log that bearing, write it down, keep it in your memory. Take a photograph. I do this sometimes um, where I want to, uh, where I think I might get confused when I do a look back. I just go ahead and take a photograph of where I've been uh, so I can call that back up. And then the key one with technology is uh, GPS breadcrumbs, uh, a track. Set a track in your GPS and um, on your way up and then you can follow it down. Or if not uh, a track, just set a waypoint, just right where you start to emerge from tree line, stop for a moment, go to your GPS, your phone or your, your standalone GPS and enter a waypoint um, at my current location. Uh, just super key strategy for you to follow. Um, and that will avoid a night, uh, unexpected night in the back country and angry spouses, friends, mothers, and children stuck at ski areas. All right, so here's another key one well known to climbers, um, because this is a technique that's used not only to find your way back, but also um, on your way back to avoid hazards that uh, you identified on the way up. So for example, if you know, we spent several minutes on the way up discerning, probing uh, where the snow bridge is solid and where it's not across a crevasse, we would drop a wand there. A wand, by the way, if you're not familiar, um, is just simply a, a small flag, like a surveyor's flag. Uh, climbers normally use little bamboo sticks, the kind that you pick up at garden centers to use to hold your house plants. And we put um, a little piece of duct tape up at the top uh, in our favorite color that we can see in the snow. Uh, and on our way up, we set those at key locations. The convention, um, particularly if you think that you may encounter some weather, uh, or you may encounter weather on your way down, unknown conditions on your way down a couple of days from now, you would set your wands uh, at every rope length. So quite literally, the, the last climber on the rope um, 
is the person, or excuse me, the first climber on the rope is the person that sets a wand. And when the last climber on the rope reaches that wand on the way up, they call out and the lead person puts in another wand. And, and you might put in, you know, 50 wands uh, along a difficult part of your route or a route that you think has a lot of hazards. So we carry a bunch of wands on, on big climbs. Um, I've done this in the Alaska range where uh, the wands were absolutely critical to our finding our way back down um, in a full on blizzard uh, and remembering where it was that we had topped out on the ice cliff so we could set up the six rappels back down the ice cliff um, to get back to our, our high camp. Um, so super great uh, technique for uh, climbers. I think this is less commonly used by anyone other than climbers, but the technique can be uh, adapted to a lot of different circumstances. So again, if, if you're going across, uh, let's say you're hiking on a trail in the gorge and it, it opens out into a big, what in the summer is a boulder field, it's covered in snow. Um, you could take sticks and put them, space them across that snow field so that on your way back down, you can find a safe route through the snow field and find where the trail um, uh, continues on after the snow field. Uh, there was a time once when I was on Mount Defiance by myself in the spring and I wished I had done that. That's uh, a hard place to find your way down from when there's snow covered. Absolutely. And yeah. I'm sure I spent a half hour wading through boulder fields trying to find the trail on the other side of the snow field. Let's keep going. <clears throat> so white out. Um, and someone asked the question earlier, how do I, uh, how do I set a bearing, I think was a question in a whiteout, where the answer is, uh, you don't do it by vision, it's not done that way, because there are no landmarks that you can use to say, okay, I know that I entered, I left the tree line down by the clump of fur sticking out high on the ridge, because uh, you can't see those fur sticking out high on the ridge. So this is where waypoints uh, come in super handy, having set a couple of waypoints uh, on your way up so that you can navigate to those on the way back down. Um, but that's going to be a problem for you. There are other problems, we'll talk more about that. The other problems for you will be vertigo, uh, the lack of landmarks above tree line, particularly, you don't have any trees. And by, when I mean landmarks, I mean, anything that you can see other than moving snow um, is a landmark. And in the absence of those, vertigo sets in. And this affects everyone. Um, if someone tells you they've never gotten vertigo in a whiteout, then they have never been in a whiteout, period. Um, you have no macro view. You can't see your tracks. You can't see the surface well enough to discern the grade even one step in front of you. Uh, and, and by the way, Indra and I know these conditions well because these are the conditions during which you call for a rescue. <laughs> these are the conditions we go out looking for you in. Go ahead, Indra. Yeah, no, no. And this is something that you may well experience yourself. I've had at least two or three times that I can think of myself where I've been on a, on a backcountry ski trip where either I myself have fallen off, thankfully a small cliff and landed in a heap down below or my buddy disappeared when I was looking the other way and was in a little pile of gear and clothing, you know, at 10 feet down some little micro drop that was not, you know, we could not see. I punched, I punched through a cornice on one of the Wendell's jumps on the Palmer snowfield once in a death wipe. And my buddies go, where'd he go? <laughs> go ahead, Andrew. So uh, here's some important strategies. Uh, the first is you've got to keep your party together. Uh, preferably you're all just staying very close to each other. Uh, in windy conditions in a wide out, you can lose party members in a moment. Um, 
you don't depend upon voice contact because it's easily lost in these conditions. Wind noise uh, and just the sound absorbing acoustics of, of snow, properties of snow and fog affect the acoustics so much that uh, voice contact can be lost just, you know, even 20 feet away. Um, so you want to maintain visual contact with your party. Uh, if you lose visual contact, just, you know, the wind whipped up, uh, the fog got thicker, uh, stay put for a moment. Don't keep trying to walk in the direction you think your party member is. Stay put for a moment. There's almost always a break in visibility. And it may take one minute, it may take five, but there's almost always a break in visibility. And suddenly you'll realize they're only 50 feet away from you but probably not in the direction you thought because vertigo has affected your sense of direction by that point. Um, so stay, stay put. Uh, a strategy for staying together, of course, for climbers, uh, a great strategy for staying together in whiteouts is you rope up. Uh, you always know your buddies at the other end of the rope. Uh, that's a strategy that works just fine even when you're not a climber. Uh, you've got 100 feet of cord in your pack. You're in white out above tree line, hard to see landmarks. Tie it to everybody's belt. Stay together. Don't lose them. Um, key, key just, I mean, it's just such a key precaution uh, in the backcountry. And again, more than once, we've had missions where parties were separated in a white out. Uh, part of the party got back and waited, and the rest of the party didn't, and rescue was required. Go ahead, Andrew. So whiteout, navigation in a whiteout, when you can't see landmarks for bearings, um, a strategy that we often use in PMR, uh, again, learn from experience, is to uh, have one of your members of your party go out in front, staying within um, visual range, which might only be 20 feet, but staying in visual range, following a bearing, and uh, the person in the back who's maintaining visual contact is directing them left to right. No, no, more down to your right, more to your right. Swing over 20 feet to your right. And then at the point that they, uh, you may lose visual contact, then the person in the back goes, they walk towards that other person almost always. Um, they can see them because the contrast between clothing and the snow provides that landmark. Uh, this is particularly important if somebody in your party is having big problems with vertigo. Um, give them somebody out in front to follow. Uh, so in addition to just following a bearing, um, you can you know, use it to, to, to help people get and keep their balance. Um, you can also do this as a kind of a simul climb approach where uh, the person in front is directed left or right by uh, the person behind them, but they both keep moving person behind them holding the compass and directing uh, the person in front towards a bearing, you know, upslope, downslope, or, or cross slope. Thanks, Andre. So um, a couple of times uh, I've been on missions on hood above treeline with um, blowing snow and whiteout. And, and by blowing snow, I mean ground snow. So fog conditions, snow blowing across the surface, cannot consistently even see my ski tips. Um, every shadow looks like a cliff. Uh, on one mission, we were searching for a fellow who was stranded in um, up at Mississippi Head, which is a series of cliffs below Illumination Saddle off to the, to the west of Timberline Lot, I mean, Timberline Ski Area. Um, and you know, we knew that we were in cliffy terrain and we're, we're a little concerned about that. And when you get to an edge, an abrupt edge, you don't know if it's six feet or, I mean, six inches or six feet or 60 feet. So some strategies that, um, that I've seen used and have used myself, first of all, um, I extend my ski pole to its maximum extension and I sweep it on the snow in front of me. I'm reaching out over my ski tips and just kind of inching along with it. Uh, so it gives me a couple of things. I can see something out in front of me. That's my ski tip. That's helpful um, just for keeping my balance. And it's also given me some feedback on what the terrain is like there. 
Uh, at one point, um, one of my buddies, another rescuer, came up with this great technique uh, on a search like this. So, wow, you know, I just wish my ski pole were longer. And so we took an avalanche probe, which is, uh, that one was, what, probably three meters, maybe four, um, attached a bandana to the end of it. So you could kind of see that as something different than the ski probe. And we swept that. One guy would go in front, sweeping the surface way out in front of their skis. And we could actually move like that. I mean, we weren't just creeping along. We were, we were moving uh, and, and able to, to both, again, keep our balance and um, discern what the terrain was and, and avoid a steep drop off. Um, I can remember a rescue we did only a couple of years ago where someone was stuck in a whiteout and the technique that they used uh, was they were picking up rocks <laughs> and tossing them out in front of them to give them something visual on the snow out in front of them to, uh, uh, to anchor themselves and, 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 and move on. That's a great idea, Mark. I, I didn't realize uh, our fellow rescuer, Troy, was as useful as he, as he is. I mean, he always wears a bandana. Now I know where to turn. Now you know where to get one. Yeah. Oh, boy. There you go. <laughs> Um, so, you know, we, we kind of, when we talk about navigation, Indra are most, most, mostly talking about how to get somewhere distant, um, you know, to your objective or back to, uh, back to safety. Um, but there's also macro navigation uh, and all the hazards that exist below the snow. Uh, we aren't really covering those in this, um, uh, in this presentation. We're happy to answer questions about it, but some hazards, particularly this time of year when we've just gotten, what, four feet of powder in just a couple of weeks on top of no base at all, uh, which means uh, voids under the snow are still there. They're not, they're not packed down. Uh, there's been no melt uh, and, and freeze cycle. Um, so, you know, on a, on a, on a macro basis, uh, your travel, your navigation can be hazardous. And this is a great time to be using ski poles to probe unknown terrain. We were skiing yesterday in four feet of powder on Gunsight Ridge down a boulder field. Uh, it was fantastic. And we were on skis and I wasn't too worried about it. But if I had been trying to um, move around on foot there, uh, it would have been absolutely treacherous because of the cavities down in the boulders. Uh, downfall, you know, there's been so many forest fires here in the last few years, the last decade on hood. Um, the downfall is super prevalent uh, on hood and, and, and generally in, in the Oregon backcountry, uh, which means, again, lots of, lots of voids under fallen logs and invisible logs that you just don't know are there and they're ready to kneecap you on, on your skis. The last thing on hazards, I just got to emphasize, I can't talk about winter um, backcountry without doing this, is tree wells. For those of you who aren't familiar with this, uh, a tree well is uh, a depressed area around the trunk of a tree. Uh, particularly true of conifers, uh, firs, and, and um, he, uh, um, firs and, and spruce and uh, large pine and, and all the things we see in, 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 in alpine and subalpine areas. Uh, their boughs tend to keep the snow from collecting right along the base of the tree. So the snow that comes in around the base of the tree is very fluffy and loose. Um, the tree's trunk is usually a similar temperature to the underlying ground, which means it's warmer than the air uh, and, and warmer than maybe the snow around it. So you get some melt out uh, that creates voids around the trees. And again, on the next snowfall, these get filled in with soft, fluffy snow. Um, it is super easy when, particularly when you're skiing in the backcountry, that's where we see it the most. Someone makes a turn above a tree. They don't really intend to be close to the tree, but as they've gotten a little close to the tree, the snow begins to give way into the tree well. The classic example is they pitch forward towards the tree because that's 
Um, that's where the, the, the momentum is taking them. And they fall head first into the tree well with their skis uh, still on top. This happens just as easily to people on snowshoes. Their skis then create an anchor that keeps them from going deeper, but they are now hanging upside down uh, in loose snow. Your strategy are you to fall into a tree well. The first thing is to get your hands immediately in front of your face and beat out an airspace around your face. As you're falling flail, grab for a limb, grab for the tree trunk, anything, to maybe keep you from falling full vertical upside down. Once you've cleared out that airspace, as I talked about, now start feeling around for limbs or tree trunk that maybe you can pull yourself back up on. I know this sounds like, particularly those of you that are young and strong and, and haven't, haven't accumulated wisdom, you think, oh man, I can get out of tree well. All right, so the um, uh, University of BC in Canada, I believe it was these guys, uh, they did this wonderful study, I don't know, 15 years ago. They got a bunch of strapping young college kids, co-ed, and uh, got them all to volunteer to jump, dive headfirst, and also jump into tree wells. And of course, this is self-selective. These are people that are backcountry enthusiasts to start with, and they were stupid enough to volunteer for this special experiment and study. They are very confident. 90% of them, nine out of 10, could not extract themselves from a tree well without assistance, right? That's how difficult it is. Um, and uh, an extended stay in a tree well means you die, uh, either a suffocation or hypothermia. Uh, stay away from trees, folks. Stay away from trees and super important, don't be going skiing or snowshoeing in the forest, in the snow without a buddy and keep your buddy in visible contact where they are skiing. I call it the dual slalom technique. I want my buddy skiing to my left or right, always in my peripheral vision. So when I go in the tree well, they at least can decide whether to extract me from it. And this, this, this has happened several times, I can think of, in the last few years here in the Pacific Northwest. Well, we had, uh, we had at least one last winter in Washington, just one I can remember as a snowboarder several years ago. It's only been about three years ago. Um, we had a fatality in a tree well in Jack's Woods at Mounted Meadows. That was in yeah. bounds. In that was bounds. the one I was thinking of most recently. Yeah. There was one yeah, on was uh, Bachelor as well. Yeah, um, two years ago maybe. So this 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 is not some, yes bachelor also. That's right. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> this is okay. not some esoteric thing that you know we talk about, but that doesn't ever happen. This happens, and it happens with some frequency. All right, Andrea, that may be my last slide. Take one more though. Yep, there huh. we go. You got one. Yeah, here we'd be prepared, Andrea. Let's do this one together. All right. So uh, when we go into the backcountry in the winter, daylight is short. Uh, conditions are unpredictable, whiteouts and navigation problems occur. What should I be prepared for? That was a question, Andre. So, oh, you should be prepared for spending an involuntary night outside. Involuntary? That doesn't sound good at all. It's not. It's cold. It's wet. It's dark. So, Sounds miserable, but I definitely want to make it to morning. What would be a good thing for me to have in my pack? Oh, definitely a headlamp. Oh, a headlamp, headlamp. with batteries that are going to last you through the night. Headlamp with batteries that might prevent me from having a night out. That's right. I, and, and by the way, um, sometime when you're still near the trailhead and it's getting dark and you're not truly lost, uh, take out your headlamp and see how difficult it is to follow your tracks with a headlamp. Those shadows that are deceiving in low light, oh, wait till you see them with a headlamp. Mm -hmm. What else would be good to have in my pack? Well, you if ready? you do get stuck, having some way to build a shelter, like a tarp, and something to keep you off of the snow, like an insulating pad, those are two really good things to have with you. And they don't weigh much if you pick the right ones. So a lot of people think, oh, a tarp, what am I going to do? Build a lean-to? Dude, 
having a tarp in your pack and it's just, you know, Indre, me and a couple other people and it's really windy and we just want to stop and get calories, whip out that, whip out that tarp, huddle together and wrap that tarp around all of us. And suddenly we have a windbreak and we have a way to, um, to maintain, to retain some of our body heat right there. We essentially just have a little stupid tent that's, and we are the tent poles. Mm -hmm. Or you can dig a quick trench and use your skis to, you know, pitch it like a little, little tent over you. Or find a tree well that can actually be a shelter and rig the tarp over the tree boughs. Yeah. And then, you know, I often get a little sweaty when I'm up backcountry skiing. So it's nice to bring something that's dry and warm. Um, I always bring my down jacket as an insulating layer. I put that on when I stop to get calories or if I have to spend the night outside, it's really nice to have something so you don't shiver the entire night. So I always carry, um, not always, it isn't true, but if I'm going on an ambitious backcountry trip or particularly if I'm going with some inexperienced folks, um, I have just a really small uh, backpacking, what is it, a, um, uh, uh, a pocket rocket. Yep, tiny, MSR pocket rocket. There you go. And it fits in a tiny little pot. And I use that because I want to fix stew. No, I use that so I can melt some snow for water. Um, even if I can't make tea, maybe I've got you know, some Gatorade or a new capsule or something that I can pop in there and get people something warm um, to drink. Uh, tea, just a tea bag is fantastic, but just water that's hot just really cheers the spirit. <laughs> it also can keep you alive. Yeah, or you can get a, one of those packets of Jello at your local Safeway. Calories! <laughs> Don't wait for it to set. You just drink yeah. hot jello water. It tastes great there and it go. gives you a bunch of calories. And if you need to mark your location, you can use the red variety <laughs> to make a big X on the snow. Okay, I know this wasn't on the list, but I gotta tell you when you say that. So uh, when I'm going out on a rescue mission and I'm rushing around the house, grabbing my gear, one of the things I do is I go by the kitchen, I throw on a pot of water um, and I throw uh, a bunch of Gatorade or another uh, um, hydration mix into a water bottle, preferably an insulated bottle. And I fill it full of boiling water, I throw it in my pack and it gives me a, some wonderful things. First, when we get to the patient, um, I've got something hot for them to drink. Two, if we don't get to the patient and I'm cold, I've got something hot to drink. And three, if we're just out for a really long time, every time I get something to drink, I can pack some more snow in that bottle and hot water will melt it. And my, um, my 750 milliliters becomes one and a half liters for the day. So great strategy. You know, great. I think that's it. Yep, food, something to eat, calories. Chocolate. Yes. Dark chocolate. That's always good. Think. That's perhaps it. Is that right? Let's see. Yes. Oh, no. Oh, I need to talk one about more. this. No, this is important. On our navigation challenges, again, learning from experience, and this still happens to me. So um, I'm having a little trouble finding my way. I, I'm just, I realize I'm not on route. Uh, I realize, ooh, I'm not exactly sure where I came out of Treeline. Um, and now I'm having to work. I've stopped. I'm not moving. I've got to work on this challenge. I'm a little worried about it. I'm pissed off because I forgot. I didn't set a waypoint. Um, maybe the other people in my party that are cold and I feel pressure. I am. What am I doing? I've reduced my activity. So I'm not warming any longer. It's not a rest stop. So I didn't think to put on an extra layer for an extended stop. Um, the problem keeps going. It's not solved immediately. Uh, and my adrenaline is going now, but I fail to refuel myself with calories. I'm not hydrating well. Um, this is a formula for hypothermia. Even before true hypothermia sets in, just cold starts interfering with my cognition and judgment. 
Um, I become more rushed, wanting to, 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 to make a decision, even though I don't have the information or I haven't analyzed it right to make the decision. Um, I dive forward because my judgment is impaired. Folks, this is so real. Um, and, and again, it's a downward spiral and, and you exercise the poor judgment. Now you're lost even worse. Navigation challenge is harder. Uh, you've gone even longer without uh, uh, fueling and, and hydrating. Um, you become even colder, your judgment gets worse. And you can just see how this is a super bad spiral. Next slide. So my solution to this, and uh, this takes self-discipline, and I have to remind myself of this. And if I don't, my wife, if she's with me, does. Um, when I'm confronted with a navigation problem in the winter, or even you know at 50 degrees and damp in the fall, um, I stop. Stop. Go ahead and put on a layer. Let's get prepared to solve this problem carefully. We've got plenty of time. We have our headlamp. We can get out. Um, put on a layer. Just go ahead and take a break. Let's talk for a moment. Um, get a little water. Maybe eat one of those chocolates, some jello. <laughs> um, and then focus on the problem of solving. Just giving yourself that moment to take care of your body, which means taking care of your brain. Uh, will make your problem solving so much better um, and stop that, uh, that death spiral into hibernation. And Indre, that is truly it. I think we're at the end. That is truly it. And I think, you know, we did not get any further questions. We did get a clarification on that location question, um, which I sort of answered in the chat. <clears throat> the three word uh, question though for you, Mark, and for everybody else is, you know, somebody came up with the brilliant idea to divide the entire world into three by three meter squares, and each square gets a three word address, so to speak. Now, this, of course, would work fine for, you know, people who know what these were, you know, how to use this system. But I think for, you know, when it comes to search and rescue for us, right, dealing with authorities, Everybody knows how to work with coordinates. That's you know old-fashioned coordinates. So, you know, in a rescue situation, in most situations, you're still going to be better off using um, standard positioning. Yeah, and for us, what uh, what we use, of course, uh, rather than using lat lon, lat longitude and latitude. Um, we are using uh, GIS coordinates and making sure that we're all working from a common datum um, and that all of our devices are set to that datum so that uh, coordinate for me is the same as one for Andre, the same as for the sheriff, the same as for the pilot. Um, although interestingly, in uh, aerial navigation, they typically use LATLON and we're often having to Translate between the two, another really great skill for you to have on your GPS is um, knowing how to move between lat line and GIS and a specific datum, but we're not going to try to cover that tonight. Yeah, Mark, do, do we have any recommendations for those who are interested in taking a class, whether it's online or in person for, you know, compass, map-based navigation, GPS? I wish... We thought about that question before we got on um, because there are a couple of folks in town and I don't have names at my fingertips uh, who teach these courses. They love to teach them to um, outdoor recreation groups, to climbing clubs, uh, and will come in and, and spend a morning with you or an afternoon and um, teach you basic map and compass, things like finding your location on a map and finding your coordinates on a map. Um, how to set waypoints on your GPS. Uh, YouTube is fantastic for um, the, 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 the phone-based GPS, the Android and iOS-based GPS. Uh, lots of good YouTube on that. Yeah, no, and, and you know, I, I, if you ever go to your public library, I don't think that the, you know, how to use a map and compass books don't get checked out very often. So you can go and get them right now. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, and, and, you know, while an old fashioned paper book is, is kind of, you know, it's not the best way to learn for many people, it still works well, you know, check it out, take it with you into the backcountry, and just work on work on doing it, you know, while you're out there. 
I think somebody, someone just posted as well yeah, a couple of great. classes. That's great. Thank you for doing that. You guys have been a great audience. <laughs> we can't even see you. Uh, somewhere there's a list of your names, but thank you so much for yes, participating thank you. with us. Um, uh, we at Portland Mountain Rescue uh, really appreciate the community support we get from you, and uh, we're there for you. Yeah, we love the mountain shop. Thank you both so much. Um, we really appreciate you taking the evening to go in depth with us on the backcountry navigation. Um, huge thanks, obviously, to Portland Mountain Rescue for all that you all do for us, keeping us safe in the mountains and looking after us. Um, so we really appreciate you. Yeah, just sharing all of your knowledge. It was cool to hear a lot of your stories and um, definitely took a lot of things away from this. Um, yeah, thanks everyone in the audience also for joining and spending your evening with us. Um, I hope this was informative and inspires you to learn more, expand your knowledge and get out into the backcountry this season. Um, Mark and Andre, if anyone has questions, do you have a good way for people to get in contact with you? Uh, you can submit questions to our, um, on our website, you can uh, find a question point to, to send questions to PMR.org. Okay. Um, and I'm one of the people that monitors that. You can also look at our Facebook page and um, post questions there and we'll try to respond to you. Sounds great. Um, I'll include that in the follow-up email. And I'll also include more details on the um, three month free trial with Onyx Backcountry Navigation app. Sweet, and everybody should do that. Yeah. yeah, we've also put together some package discounts on products for navigation and also some of the overnight essentials um, based on recommendations from PMR. So I will include that as well in, in the follow-up email. Um, and that is it. So thanks everyone. Have a great night. We'll Be safe out there. Thanks everybody. Good night.